in lieu of not being able to go to shows for a long time, shows and concerts, who knows when it'll be. It might be the fall. It might be even beyond that. Uh, we thought of a segment that um, each one of us comes up with three or four uh, different tours or uh, bands touring off an album or it could be a band touring from a certain year um, that we would pay $1,000 to see. So, for example, um, this isn't one of mine, but an example would be I would love to see Metallica tour off the Black album right before it released because they played this specific band venue that I love and Anthrax opened, you know? And yeah. then, so we're going to do it like a round robin style and basically defend our choices. And then once we give our spiel, the other two, um, two of us will just kind of shoot the shit on it and comment on it. So, yeah. yep. um, I don't know what the segment's called, but just, um, tour dream. Like yeah. A, tour dreams. Tour dreams. <laughs> <laughs> tour dreams. Uh, you know, tour, tour time machine. Tour time that? machine. Yeah. I like, like that. I, nice. I have one on here that happened before all of us were born. So actually two, oh, nice. if you look at my, one of my honorable mentions. Um, so yeah, there, there's a, and some of it, you might actually need to get into a plane too and fly somewhere. So it's not necessarily where you're, where you're at. Tour time machine. I like that. Yeah. And we may revisit this in future episodes, but given the, yeah, the climate. Three, three or four was hard. I, yeah. I could have had 10 or 15. So. Exactly. So given the climate now that there's no live music for the foreseeable future, this is a fun, fun, fun time to do this. So who wants to start? Nate, you want to go? Yeah, I have a few too, but uh, let's see. I'm going to do a band that I've seen quite a bit, actually. But uh, for whatever reason, this one really stuck out to me. It's Nine Inch Nails promoting the Fragile record uh, with a perfect circle opening. Um, every time I look at any kind of footage from that or set list or really just the backstory on what, it was, what happened into the making of the Fragile album, it's like he was in a you know pretty crazy state of mind. He'd recorded the album in New Orleans. Um, a Perfect Circle, obviously, is uh, not obviously. We're all nerds here, but uh, for people listening, is Maynard from from the band Tool. So similar to Nine Inch Nails, a powerhouse of a band. Um, so to see those both on that tour, uh, and Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails kind of coming back after a few years, uh, reclusive to an extent. You know, he's a reclusive guy anyway, but. Um, dealing with you know some pretty heavy drug addiction and um, just just to be at that tour I mean I've just I look back and I'm like man 2000 wasn't even that that long ago and that we were in high school I, I just remember like a lot of these shows would roll through but we were actually like 15 we weren't quite 16 so we didn't quite have our licenses yet but mm. that 99 game, that was a game like, changer mm -hmm. to get the license yeah, 99 yeah. to like 2000 or like even 98 it's like we just missed a lot of these really amazing gigs mm -hmm. but um that was one that really stuck out for me because I always look back at it. I had that on my list and, and didn't do it oh, because really? I, I had a feeling you might. And I oh, also, I mean, we saw him. I've seen him four or five times and, and obviously I've enjoyed it a ton. Um, but I was like, you know what? This might be one that could be a, a, a crossover. So I'll, I'll let, I'll let Nate have it if he does pick it because we both, wow. I, we, I, we, you and I have talked about this album for years, just ad nauseum. Oh, we both love it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not the so happiest good. album ever, but. I think it stuck out recently too because, uh, and I sent you guys this both in a text, is because I'm kind of mashing up a lot of the songs off this album with kind of what's going on today to try to, in a weird way, therapeutically get through this craziness we're going through. So if you put fragile, yep. anything off of fragile as a backdrop to like, I don't know, the news or any, anything that is surreal right now, it's, it's, it almost seems like, you know, because you'll watch the news and you're like, man, it seems like a movie. So if you play the news or any of these, uh, developments in real time with uh, songs off the fragile as a backdrop. It's like, all right, <laughs> this is just a movie. You know, yeah, this is just not. This is the visuals would have been wild. Oh my god, yeah. the visuals. Were, I mean, they, the visuals are always the visuals wild for the video. Yeah, you know, for the videos are wild. It's it's interesting, Nate. When you said um, a perfect circle opened, my head went to were a perfect circle even a band then, but obviously they were. They had just dropped uh, Meredith Meredith Arms. Arms, first album in two thousand. Yep. Okay. And that's Maynard. You said. Um, Billy Howard L. Was James Eha in the band then? Who? James Eha. He was in the band too, yeah, right? Yeah, he was in that Back lineup, then. Yeah. And then was it Freeze, the drummer? Yep, Josh Freeze. Perfect from, yep. uh, I'm a nerd. Uh, originally from the Vandals. Yep. Yep. And also Actually did some Vandals. stuff with Nails after. Probably because of this. Freeze. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
when it wasn't Dave Grohl. E- Ehow, was he Smashing Pumpkins? Yeah. Smashing yeah. Pumpkins, yeah. Yep. Um, super group, Jesus. Dude, right? I mean, think about just, I love A Perfect Circle, love Tool. So to see both of them together and in 2000, probably wasn't a huge fan of Nine Inch Nails. That came a couple of years later for me. But I definitely became a huge fan of them in the 03, 04 range after I graduated high school and, and you know, became friends with a few people that were into them and then just it turned into a thing for me. Um, Merit and Oms, I remember buying Merit and Oms at Bull Moose in Portland, uh, walking downstairs and grabbing that CD and being into it because I liked, you know, the single. So being... Mm-hmm. Being at that, that would have been an amazing, amazing show to be at with those two out together. Just um, Reznor and Maynard, just nuts. What uh, a, what size venues were they playing, awesome. Nate? What size venues was that tour? Oh, uh, those were arenas, so they weren't like massive, uh, you know, amphitheaters or anything like that. But they were definitely uh, arenas for sure. I think in Boston they. And I, you can't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure they played the Garden for that one. Yeah, that makes would make sense. sense. I mean, that they, would totally makes sense. He's coming off of Downward Spiral, which was big, so that makes sense. Yeah, uh, might have been Song of Serena actually. And Lowell, I'd have to check. Yep, uh, that's smaller. Need, that's smaller. We need yep. settler for this. Yeah, yeah, we need, we need a fact checker. Yeah, that's a. I mean, that that's a good pick, Nate. I mean, I I I'm I'm biased because I almost put it on my list too. So, <laughs> well, it's just crazy because like. We were talking about like just missing the cusp on, on on stuff like that. But those are the bands that you would be in high school or you'd be in school, like seeing like someone wear a sweatshirt and be like, what is that, Nin? What is Nin? You know, yeah, you're like, right? I, don't, like, I don't even know what that is. Okay. And then you finally discover it. And you're like, oh, that guy was on this stuff early. Like, yeah. I wish I, yeah. I wish he had given me the heads up on this, you know, or even Tool or any of these bands that I just didn't, for whatever reason, get to that band yet. And I wish that, you know, speaking of, uh, Looking in retrospect, like, man, I wish I had just someone had given me the tip on that earlier because I would have somehow made it to that show or would have picked up these records earlier. Because when you're finding out about a band after something like that, it's still obviously really cool. But to see them in what we're talking about on this subject in that in their prime or in that on that touring cycle or whatever in their in their headspace at that time, obviously it makes for a different show. Um, It's kind of a kind of a weird it's a kind of a bummer, but, you know, it is what it is. But that's. That's what it's all about. It's, well, it's nerd, it's nerd. And I, yeah, exactly. And, and I would say we we got to see them probably four or five times in the coming years after that. That album came out nine 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 ninety nine, right? Mm-hmm. Does that sound right? Something like that. Yep. Uh, and so we saw we got to see them in oh one or oh three oh four oh five in the in that range probably four or five times a couple nights in a row and Tuan I think you were at one of those shows too in Boston oh six at the at, at the, the Orpheum uh, Orpheum yeah in Boston yeah. Massachusetts small venue for them tiny venue for them I remember the Dresden second dolls. night because we went yeah the Dresden Dolls yeah whatever um, we the second night of that um, of that stint because we went down for two nights uh, Nate and I and a couple other friends we I remember the the ceiling. It was so loud in there that pieces of the ceiling were falling down on us because we were <laughs> oh, up in the yeah. balcony for that second night. The first night, I think I was down on the bottom, but the second night, I was up top. And I just remember mm-hmm. looking up and being like, what is happening here? And just being like, this yeah. is amazing. Like, I'm just, I'm loving this. So we did get yeah, to see him and we did get to, uh, at Portland, I remember going to Portland, you and I, Nate, mm-hmm. um, uh, drink, drinking a little bit of Zenka of vodka outside of it right before we walked into the show and getting all the way up to the front for the beginning of that concert. That that was an all timer for me too. So we were fortunate oh, yeah. enough to see him four or five times after that and get a lot of those um, uh, fragile songs on on those tours, which is cool. He wasn't in the same headspace obviously because he had cleaned up and kind of turned into a workout workout dude. But yeah, it was still pretty cool to see that stuff. Yeah, I went, I had to give him props too because. Um, because he's an inspiration. That guy's very, a very intelligent guy, amazing songwriter, amazing performer. But uh, as an individual, you know, if you watch any interviews with him uh, so at thoughtful. all on any subject, I mean, he's like a legitimate genius. And it's really cool because he's very coherent. Um, he was able to to get past the, the drug addiction. And he's yep. almost like a, I want to compare him to like a Robert Downey Jr. where he was able to get out of that yeah. darkness and become a very polished um professional and someone i definitely uh i look up to 
very highly. Well, and at the top of his game, I mean, he's won Oscars for scores for movies like uh, The Social Network and... Um, that's mm-hmm. right. And, and just the visuals um, of the videos. Girl, you know yeah. that's him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He is the creative genius behind that, all that stuff. So uh, not for everybody. Obviously, some of the stuff is a little bit down, but the, the music itself, if you just put aside some of the feelings that are happening and listen to the music, it's technically amazing. Like, there's some just great stuff there. All right, Nate, what's your, what you got, man? All right. Let's see here. It shows uh, Deftones touring for Around the Fur in 98. Uh, super cool time for the new metal scene. Uh, it's kind of a weird term, new metal, but they were touring with bands like Limp Bizkit, Incubus, Head PE, some Slipknot dates in there, Cold Chamber. That whole scene, like before it exploded, maybe like one and a half years later, uh, obviously became the scene that we know as new metal, where everything on Ozfest, all these really cool bands that became ginormous. Limp Bizkit, obviously, we talked about them last time. Huge Slipknot, huge. Incubus, huge in their own right, like, um, and Deftones for some, interestingly enough, not on that huge, massive selling amphitheater level, which is probably why I love them because they're able to stay organic, genuine, uh, and still play theaters and stuff. And they'll play like co-headlining gigs at, at big arenas and stuff like that once in a while. Um, but to be there at those gigs would have been so cool because, uh, it's my favorite Deftones album and uh super diverse record and uh the energy behind that band obviously chi the bassist we referred to earlier hadn't passed away yet so he had a full lineup um they were super young and um i think that was kind of even though their first record did pretty well i mean this is their second release on a major on maverick records um i feel like that's probably where they really you know got the wind in their sails and they've been kind of a cult following a band ever since, but I, uh, I look at those dates, those lineups, those set lists, and man, I would have been at as many of those shows as humanely possible. Cause it would have been just so cool to see not only them, but the bands that they were coming up with, they were kind of all friends, um, for that era. And it's, they're still going today. It's fantastic, fantastic band. Yep. And, uh, so Nate, can I piggyback on that? Yeah, we, we so. can do, we can do a combined one here. So, uh, nice. My next one was Deftones, ninety six, ninety seven era. So touring oh, off, wow. a, touring off Adrenaline, wow. okay, with Very probably cool. some Around the Fur mixed in. You know, so yeah. if it's yep. before mm-hmm. the album comes out. Um, yep. Other angles were all in the early twenties, super energetic. Um, Chino, like in twenty twenty, he can still hit a lot of those screams and notes, but he was fresh, yeah. fresh, fresh, fresh back then. Um, yeah. And then just for fun, I looked up. In that 95 to 97 era, some of the tours they were on, mm-hmm. one of them was the War of Gargantua's tour, which was Deftones, Pantera, White Zombie, and I Hate God. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, another one was Deftones, Snapcase, and Orange 9mm. And this one would have been pretty cool too. 1995, Stomping Around the World tour, <laughs> Deftones, Anthrax, Life of Agony, from New York and Monster Magnet. Oh wow! So, oh man, a, a lot of those bands are st- actually still at it. But yeah. what mm-hmm. what jumped out to me was just the diversity. Like, I hate God's like a thrash band who I actually saw last year. Snapcase is a like a hardcore punk band. Mm-hmm. Um, Life of Agony was like New, New York hardcore. Anthrax thrash. Monster Magnet kind of like industrialist rock, I guess. Like stoner, stoner, stoner. Rock, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, just piggybacking on that. So any, I think wow. the punchline is anything around that time frame, yeah. you couldn't go wrong with Deftones. Oh no, especially not if you were a fan of the genre. The, I look back at the mid to late '90s all the time and just have um, just so much regret, like nerd geek regret on. But we're ten. Man, if I just had my <laughs> license, I would have been at all these gigs yeah. like yeah. easily because I was already looking at them on Polestar and stuff, just being like, man, I wish I could get to this gig. I'd have no way to get there. Uh, not as far back as 98, but definitely stuff in 99. But um, 97, 96, like, holy crap. That that uh, Pantera uh, White Zombie Deftones tour, I did see that on a on a set list or something. And they played, I think they played Lewis and Maine on that tour. Wow. Yep. Uh, Lewiston used to incredible. get shows back in the yeah. mid-90s. Like, they, they got shows. Lewiston was a venue. 
uh-huh. or or a, a destination as far as some of these tours would, were concerned. Uh, which, if you look at it now, Lewis and Maine, like really, but, I mean, it's it's in a it's an Olympus Biscuit song. He, right. <laughs> he shouts yeah. out at Lewis and Maine, so it was a place that people would go to for, it's bizarre for shows. Too. It also has a, one of the more iconic venues, just as far as uh, venues in the country, um, the Colosseum where Muhammad yeah. Ali fought so there is a place for that stuff to happen and we've seen i've seen a show there and i've been there for work for other things but yeah Yeah. it's just it's funny to hear lewiston (laughs) get brought up because it's just such a you know yeah tiny little east coast town in a small state yeah and that arena is super shabby i saw green day oh it's cleaned up now it's great now no they did a really good job in there yeah it's nice now so i did see a show there in in that era was green day in 98 promoting Nimrod. Yep. I can't remember if Nimrod is out yet. But, uh, I th- I feel wasn't like it just was. Green Day, right? What was, wasn't there another band with them? Ah, uh, there was. I can't remember the wasn't name. Wasn't Foos. Uh, huh? Wasn't the Foos. They would have been on their own at that nope. point. Ah, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. We but, also uh, went to another show there, Nate. We saw Weezer and The Fray there. Yep. In yep. 2005. Mm-hmm. So. But, yeah, those Deftone awesome. shows would have been would have been very heavy and very, you know, just crowded, raw. sweaty, yeah. uh, pit. You know, if you're looking to expel some energy, that would have been a place for you that time during that. During that, uh, I know we saw we all went to Deftones in, in Bangor, Maine, for a, a little festival they used to put on called Kabang for a buddy of our bachelor party. The three of us probably eight or nine years ago, and um, I remember being in, I was in the pit for a solid, I don't know, three minutes. Went kind of turned just absolutely laid somebody out it was a girl i felt terrible <laughs> i grabbed her hand i pulled her up I'm like i'm really sorry she was like no you're cool i shouldn't be in here <laughs> like all right cool i shouldn't be either because i'm now old this is kind of uh, out, out of where i should be at this point so but that was uh that was the only time i ever got to see deftones but we i mean i feel like that was a pretty fun set too i think that was on were they out for diamond diamond eyes diamond eyes then diamond right eyes. yeah so yep. um but yeah, Nate. So I, hi- I hijacked you a little bit. So did you have anything else oh. on uh, around the fur era? Uh, it was kind of go- similar to what you were saying. It's like not only is it them in a different prime because they're always just on top of their game, but um, to be at that you know at that level at that time with touring with bands also coming up that are also you know bands I admire and look up to, seeing them in that. Oh, yeah at that time must have been so so cool um but uh man i didn't i didn't think about the adrenaline era because it's not my fit not one of my my most favorite deftones albums i revisit it once in a while but for the most part i'm still stuck on uh around the fur and a lot of the other albums but um yeah man i'm with you i mean i guess all together it's just one of those all-time nerd bands Uh, deftones is a fantastic What do you got next, Nate? Oh, is it my turn? Yeah. Yeah, you're up. Last one. Cool. Cool. Well, last one for you, and then I'll go. Yeah, cool. (laughs) (laughs) Cool. Cool. Well, I didn't know we could choose bands that were... uh, Oh, well, we'll do this again, I didn't know it was tours that were uh, before we were born, but if that were the case, we'll have to do this. I can't wait to do the segment again, because I got a lot. Yeah, for sure. There's so much. (laughs) But for one hour, when we were, in fact, born and alive and and, uh, just not fortunate enough to either know about the music or get to the gig or whatever it is... Um, and f- I'm sorry for the listeners, and I'm actually sorry to Tone and Tuan that they have to always hear me bring up this goddamn band. But Pearl Jam is my favorite. <laughs> You're band. good, man. You're good. <laughs> it is my favorite band. I've loved them ever since middle school as well. Until that's kind of like when I first got into music. And me and my brother had this like uh, I wouldn't say rivalry, but he was you know gung ho Smashing Pumpkins fan, which I I absolutely love as well. And I was a gung ho Pearl Jam fan. We were always kind of like, oh, this song's better. This song's better. This song's better. Um, there's always that kind of weird rivalry, like um, in the 90s, it's like Limp Bizkit or, or Korn, you know, who's better? Um, there's always a, and I think it's actually pressure from the industry. It's actually not on a fan basis at all, but. Um, you can like both. I mean, yeah, you, can. you can like both. Yeah, yeah they're all I good. love Smashing uh, Pumpkins. I love Pearl Jam. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Both fantastic and way different th- than each other's music completely. Exactly. Uh, but Pearl Jam, I was going to say for 91 uh, or even 1990 going into 91. So since we're doing like a series of years as an era uh, before they put out 10, you know, they yeah. were kind of yep. uh, a, a mashup of a former band, Mother Love Bone and the members of that band. And Eddie was living in San Diego, actually, 
um, and you know, throw a demo tape up to them in Seattle when uh, the singer from Mother Love Bone passed away. And they kind of, I guess you could say it was a precursor to a, a super group because they had recruited this guy from San Diego, not Seattle, to kind of start a brand new band. But obviously it wasn't a super group because no one knew who Eddie was at the time. <clears throat> um, and they'd come up uh, very organically and recorded together and, and started playing gigs. And those gigs were, uh, you know, kind of the starting point, kind of happening same time as Nirvana was getting started, same time. Soundgarden had been around for a while. Alice in Chains was pretty established at this point. So they were doing gigs with uh, opening for Alice, Ch- Alice in Chains under the name Mookie Blaylock. Yes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Which is also yeah. why they named the first album 10, because that was the number he wore. He was an NBA player oh, back in that, the early I never 90s, knew that. late 80s, early 90s. They played for the Atlanta Hawks and then other places too. But they uh, they were originally Mookie Blaylock and then <laughs> named out the album. They changed to Pearl Jam and they named the album 10. Because that's I think awesome. That was the number I, that's that Mookie news wore. to me. Yep. Yeah, they were forced to do so, actually. Uh, they would have stuck with the name if they could. Amazing. Imagine them being on tour right now as Mookie Blaylock still. Like, <laughs> long after <laughs> Mookie's bizarre. career, playing they, career. Would they have sold as many shirts? <laughs> they would have know. sold a lot of 10 shirts, probably with Pearl Jam on. Oh, I guess not Pearl Jam. Blaylock. MB or Blaylock. Or, yeah, who knows? Well, they bring up this uh, this era for this band, not because of the obvious reasons of just seeing them uh, you know, in their formable, year, formable years or whatever, but uh, the stories I hear for people that did see him at this time are really fascinating because um if you see and you can actually look up a lot of this footage on youtube and stuff but um eddie was crazy man he would climb off the he was, stage he, was he would nuts. go off, jump off balconies he was they'd call him crazy ed i mean that was his nickname so he was kind of like a wild child and uh but i've talked to a lot of cool people in fact my boss's wife is from seattle so she got to see all this stuff as it was coming up and she said it was just incredible incredible to see um, and I just wish uh, that I could be there for that because I already obviously adore the music, but to see it in that kind of uh, raw, small club, kind of what you were saying, Tuan, with Rage Against the Machine and these small clubs, Eddie's obviously got a you know powerhouse of a voice, uh, baritone voice, so to see that energy, that voice, that band kind of magically come together, that chemistry, to see it kind of uh, unravel must have been uh Really, really cool. That would have been. And I mean, fun nobody, to see nobody sounds like Eddie. There isn't another Eddie Vedder out there. He, it's him. He's one of a kind. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. I've, I've still ne- have... never seen them. I I don't think I will. Just I it's don't see it happening. But tougher and tougher. Um, it? Yeah. They would have been a good one to see, yeah. but I never saw him. I saw him once with Nate um, in Boston about 2006 when they were on tour for Avocado, the self-titled. Album. Mm-hmm. We we went down uh, and stayed there and saw them on f- like Thursday or Friday night and then we went to we walked around Boston all day and then we saw Modest Yahoo Atmosphere Brother Ali at the Bank of America Pavilion the nice. next night and we uh, we we had a pretty fun couple of days if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, that was awesome. Just kind of on the whole, thinking about um, you know the the grunge era in Seattle. There's a, a great oral history called Everybody Loves Our Town by Mark Yarm, which I've read. It's a, it's if you're into that era of music, you know, Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, uh, Mother Love Bone, uh, Green River, I would I would highly recommend picking that book up. It's it's, it's a little older, so you'll find it in paperback, you find it on Amazon. People that are stuck yeah. at home looking for something to read. Very cool. Kind of gives you a, a history of the early grunge days in Seattle. Yeah, and that author is the uh, vocalist from Mud Honey, which is one of those bands as well. Oh, wow. It's cool. That, yep. From that era, so it's definitely yep. coming from right from the horse's mouth, which is yep. really cool. Good awesome. pull. 